my dear Divevani viewers, welcome to the Word of God program. In the last couple of talks, I shared with you some thoughts about the book of the Exodus with all those events that are narrated in the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus is in a way central to the whole Bible that was really an experience that the Israelites had and it is that God experience that made them people of God. God promised that God will be their God and that they will be God's own people. And many events that took place in the Exodus are celebrated in the liturgy. And in that way, it is every year renewed, especially by the liturgical celebrations of the Jews as well as of the Christians. The God experience they had was something that is so unique and real. Perhaps no other religion had such a, an intervention of God into the lives of the whole people. It is not just mythical narrations. It was the real people experiencing God's real intervention in history. And in that way, all the events of the Exodus are unique, are historical. The leader, the Pharaoh, Ramesses II, who ruled Egypt from 1290 to 1224 BC, is someone who stands unique because it is in his time all those events took place. And because of that, again, they are all historical. The central thought regarding Exodus is that that was the moment the Israelites experienced God's presence. That was the moment, that was the time they experienced God directly, and that remained in their lives all through. With all those introduction regarding the book of Exodus, with all those importance which I already shared with you, we move into the book itself, and maybe we will go a bit more into the details of the book of Exodus. In order to understand the book of Exodus, maybe we'll have to go back to the Genesis and how the Israelites happened to enter, reach Egypt. The first part of the book of Exodus actually provides both the background for the departure and the actual start of the departure of the Exodus from Egypt. The background is also worth noting because there is a continuation of the narrations in the book of Genesis. The final editor of the book, I already shared with you, there are, there are three major contributors to this, the Yahvist, the Elohist, and the priestly redactor. And the final editor who put all these together did not actually compromise. He just took whatever matter he got, and therefore here and there we can notice discrepancies, even opposing reports, but they are all in order to help us understand the whole event. The final edit 
Peter most likely edited these books in 400 BC. He pulled together the work of all the three major principal sources and he added some more from perhaps other sources. In a spirit of fidelity to these sources and traditions, the final editor chose not to even out various repetitions and inconsistencies. However, he obtained a certain flow to the narrative. The story moves on even without any hindrance, without any stoppage. In this first part of the book of Exodus, the final editor seeks to provide answers to a few important questions such as what brought about the misery for the Israelites in Egypt. The misery was terrible and that is narrated and why that happened, what, what brought about such misery. Another question, the second one, what are the credentials of the leader? How did this leader respond to God's call? In what ways did the leader attempt to deal with the Pharaoh? What was the final catalyst that provoked the Exodus, the going out from Egypt? How should Israel continue to celebrate this going out? What happened as Israel journeyed to the Red Sea? How did God intervene at the Red Sea? The background of the introduction in Exodus chapter 1 verses 1 to 7 is actually from Genesis chapter 46 verses 1 to 4. I will read from Genesis 46, 1 to 4. When Israel set out on his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's own hand shall close your eyes. This passage sums up the past referring to the patriarchs, Isaac and Jacob. It also anticipates the future. Namely, Israel will become a great nation in Egypt and God himself will lead them out. At the same time, this passage creates tension and raises a problem. What will happen to God's people when they do leave Egypt? And how can such a small group become a great nation? Exodus chapter 1 verses 1 to 7 is actually the priestly text and verse 7 reflects the priestly typical vocabulary of fruitful, numerous, filled, and so on. It's the fulfillment of the command in Genesis 1.28, be fertile and multiply, fill the earth. Against the background of the exile, this passage is intended by the priestly writer 
to offer hope and encouragement to God's despondent people. Their temptation is to disparage the promised land and not return from exile. Numbers chapter 14 verses 1 to 3 and 5 to 10 give a certain account of the real situation. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry and the people wept that night. And all the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become booty. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? We'll have a short break. <music> Welcome back. The Israelites, when they left Egypt, situation was rather painful and many of them perhaps wanted to return, did not want to move out of Egypt. And that narration in Numbers chapter 14 verses 5 to 10 shows how miserable the condition was. I will read. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the Israelites. And Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Je Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the Israelites, The land we went through as a spies is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are no more than bread for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But the whole congregation threatened to stone them. The priestly writer is fond of genealogies and lists. For example, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, and chapter 6, 9, you get lists. They are all priestly redactors. Genesis 5, 1 to 2, this is the list of the descendants of Adam. When God created humankind, he made them in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them humankind when they were created. Genesis 6, 9 to 10. These are the descendants of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth. These details by the priestly writer 
explain how the small group developed into such a significant number. The oppression of the Israelites is another special event in the history, special because that actually will make the Israelites move out of Egypt and that would become the primary cause of the Exodus itself. Exodus chapter 1 verses 8 to 14 gives a certain explanation of what happened. I read, Then a new king who knew nothing of Joseph came to power in Egypt. He said to his subjects, Look how numerous and powerful the Israelite people are growing, more so than we ourselves. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them to stop their increase. Otherwise, in time of war, they too may join our enemies to fight against us and so leave our country. Accordingly, taskmasters were set over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. Thus, they had to build for Pharaoh the supply cities of Pithom and Ramesses. Yet, the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. The Egyptians then dreaded the Israelites and reduced them to cruel slavery, making life bitter for them with the hard work in mortar and brick and all kinds of field work, the whole cruel fate of slaves. The policy of reducing the people to slave labor force of building was normal for the Egyptian autocrats, but it was opposed to Israel's tradition of freedom. Joseph purchased for Pharaoh all the grain, all livestock, and all the land. Genesis chapter 47, verses 13 to 26. I read, Now there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe. The land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Joseph collected all the money to be found in the land of Egypt and in, in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. When the money from the land of Egypt and from the land of Canaan was spent, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? For our money is gone. And Joseph answered, Give me your livestock, and I will give you food in exchange, in exchange for your livestock. If your money is gone, that is what I will do. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the herds, and the donkeys. That year, he supplied them with the food in exchange for all their livestock. When that year was ended, they came to them the following year and said to him, We cannot hide from my Lord that our money is all spent and the herds of cattle are my lords. There is nothing left in the sight of my lord but our bodies and our lands. 
Shall we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land in exchange for food. We with our land will become slaves to Pharaoh. Just give us seed so that we may live and not die, and that the land may not become desolate. Imagine the desperate situation where the Egyptians had to sell everything to Pharaoh. And Joseph, on behalf of Pharaoh, purchased all that. I continue. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. All the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine was severe upon them. And the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he made slaves of them from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy. For the priests had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Now that I have this day bought you your land and your land for Pharaoh, and four fifths shall be your own, as a seed for the field, and as food for yourselves and your households, and as food for your little ones. They said, You have saved our lives. May it please my Lord. We will be slaves to Pharaoh. So Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, and it stands to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth. The land of the priests alone did not become Pharaoh's. So the Egyptians were already used to slavery, whereas the Israelites were not used to. The Yahwist not only registers Egypt's usual attitude, but accentuates the threat that Israel posed and the opposite results of the Egyptian oppression. The oppression that was meant to reduce the strength of the Israelites actually led to their growth in number. The Yahweh notes this new policy of the Egyptian government. With the emergence of a new king whom the tradition chooses to leave nameless, there is a new manner of dealing with the prolific Israelites. Thus the oppression is directly related to the political threat that such numbers imply. One can legitimately ask whether the imposition of slave labor is really calculated to achieve the royally observers of the Egyptian plan. We will continue next week with the first chapter of Exodus. Thank you very much for listening to me. May Jesus bless you.